Good morning and welcome to To The Point. Mass shootings around the nation over the past couple of weeks have lawmakers thinking of ways to try to protect people here in Michigan from the very same type of attacks. Tommy Brand is a state house member, a Republican from Wyoming. That is one of the things we talked to him about when he sat down with us this week. Representative, let's talk a little bit about where we are in the process of budgeting for the state of Michigan, because there are a lot of people who are wondering how long it's going to take. We know what the deadline is. It's the end of September, mm -hmm. but we also know it's gone past that in years past. So from your perspective, where are we budget wise with the legislature probably not heading back in until the week of the 26th of August? Yeah, it'd be last week of August. and um, but it's not where I want to be. I mean, I like to, I like getting things done. I'm a restaurant owner. I like um, making decisions and making fast decisions. Um, we're, we're working on it. Um, it's the budget is, of course, mainly is a road tie-up. Um, right now, we have 4.7 billion for roads. Um, we're looking at taking the gas tax, which is 855 million, and putting that towards roads and still protecting schools with Wayfair, 143 million from Wayfair, which is online sales tax. So we're look we're looking at making some good decisions, um, but it's it's I'm on appropriations as a small businessman. I really want to be on appropriations. This is my second term, and I'm I'm good at that job, and I watch every penny of of our of our my constituents because um, my area my restaurant division. I mean it's a it's a great section of town, but I I look down and see the small houses and see some of the families struggling. So I I get where every penny counts. One of the big differences between what you and the House uh, are, are dealing with, talking about, and what the governor has talked about, you're talking about taking the sales tax, uh, gas tax, all of that, putting that towards uh, the roads. She's talking about raising the gas tax by 45 cents per gallon. And we hear from leadership on both ends, uh, both uh, with Senate Majority Leader Shirky and uh, with Speaker Chatfield, that that increase in the gasoline tax doesn't stand a really good chance of even coming up for a boat doesn't sound like no i mean i'm you know my restaurant i base a lot of my restaurant when i go to lansing i i had i had one person um in winter time this, um, this is i gotta tell you the story sadly he came in drunk off the street homeless and i i get back from lansing at restaurant about 6 30 and my bartender comes to see it, says there's somebody in the, in your men's room stripped down his underwear and it's a sad case he is a homeless person so i got him dressed i took him to mel trotter and god bless mel trotter and, and got him safe i bring that to lansing i bring the sadness of life to lansing and part of the sadness of life is my servers and my cooks are good people they can't afford that 45 cents tax and it, it's also the word trickle down is very powerful here it's going to trickle down to to Myers or Gordon Food Service when they deliver food for their for their gas for their, how much they're gonna pay for gas it's gonna make higher costs for blue collar workers and people going to grocery stores so that's just it's just too much and I, I, I like a governor it's that's just not the right decision well the the question then becomes and this is not yours to answer because you've got 109 colleagues that are gonna have to come up with a decision uh, along with 38 on the other end but right. the question has to be where do you find a, uh, a landing, a soft spot to land? So is there, uh, is there some combination? Does it end up being some uh, new revenue as well as using existing revenue? Because I know over in the House you haven't dealt with new revenue at all, have you? Uh, we haven't. And um, you know, I'm on transportation of probes. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, everything I'm, all the judicial, everything is probes for me. And appropriation is, of course, the money and budget. And I, I met with them dot a lot, and they say no matter how much money they have, they work on 12.7% of the roads because they don't want to get you and me upset with all the cones. Well, first of all, if they do get first some First of all, too late, but yeah, <laughs> but go ahead. Good point, good point. And last year, we were behind the roads because we had an engineer strike for a while. So some of that is not just all money. But if we, I, I, have, I did not sign a no tax pledge, I don't think, you know that's responsible um i think um you know as a restaurant owner i can't sign i'm never going to raise a hamburg price but right now i'm looking after my area and um they can't afford that 45 cents and right now i, I mean I, I haven't heard anything about new revenue the 855 million from the sales tax from the pump that's that's quite a lot of money and we're 4.7 billion right now which is the highest roads ever had so 
But I do agree with the governor, there is a problem. I mean, sh she's, she's a smart lady that way. Let's talk about something else you brought up uh, in the story about the man who came into your restaurant off yeah. the street, and that's mental health. It becomes very poignant right now because we have had two recent instances of mass shooting, and while we don't know fully what was behind it, my personal belief is there has to be a mental health component to anybody who goes into a crowd and starts taking lives randomly. One of the, the things that you have pointed at that you are interested in doing and uh, in looking at some of your priorities is improving mental health, and that also ties in with some other legislation you're working on. But when you talk about improving mental health, which, by the way, is one of the speaker's uh, passions, too, I think he's very interested in that. What can the state do? How can the state do what can you and the legislature do uh, to help people with mental health issues? Well, ch um, Chairman Whiteford from DHHS has, has she has a, um, she, a simple uh, phone number you can call for mental health. She looked at also bedding, available bedding, and so we voted on that last term. Um, I know we've done away with uh, mental health hospitals. I, I don't I don't have the 100% answer on that, but I think it's something we have to look into. A jail's not the answer all the time. And, um, and I'm also working on an extreme risk measure bill, which um, you can call a red flag bill, call it like it is. But I've, I've been working on this for about eight months. They're working down, the lawyers are working on Lansing right now. And this bill, if, if for instance, my brother, who I love, but let's say one of my brothers is just having problems, and I, just, I was worried about him, and he has a gun. You know, I, I want the opportunity where the court, where I go to the court and say, I'm worried about my brother. I'm worried about my brother doing something to take that gun away. Or if my brother was I think, starting to kill somebody else or go to a mall. I think this is a, um, President Trump actually mentioned it. And we got um, a couple of senators from federal senators using it. Rubio's got a red flag bill. Um, I'm looking at one for the state of Michigan. And I'm working on it right now. There comes the question of due process and yes. the Constitution and all of the yeah, things of that, that go along with that. But one of the, one of the things I wonder uh, about that, how can you structure it in such a way that I, for example, don't say a nemesis of mine I think is in danger of hurting themselves or others just to get them gummed up with the law? I mean, how, how do you... How, how do you quantify the claim that's made by a third party that says this person's dangerous? First of all, I own a gun, you know, because I, you know, I'm, I want to protect my wife. And, and, and law-abiding guns is a cliche city here, but law-abiding guns should, should have guns. I mean, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not one of those radicals. But the answer to that is, in, in the bill I'm working on, is it's, if you do that, it's a felon. It's not a misdemeanor, it's not a slap in the wrist, it's a felon. And so that's a serious offense, and you're right, and that shouldn't happen. And, um, but it goes through the court system, too, so there is a due process. But, I mean, I mean we can't, we, gotta, we, ha we have to do something. We can't have, keep this, this going in our country or, or our state. Moving from that to another piece of legislation that you're working on, and I think you may have some support, maybe some bipartisan support on this, you would like to raise the age that people can buy, at least, and ideally consume tobacco, or at least smoking, right. to 21. And I, that's I, something you've been talking about for a while. Where I, are you with that? Well, um, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a slow process. I really believe it's a right bill. I mean, 16,500 people a year have uh, medical issues because of uh, smoking and this bill would actually prevent 60 not prevent but help prevent 16 year olds from getting cigarettes because 18 year olds hang around 16 year olds if they're 21 so it's going to save lives so I'm, I'm working on it i'm asking i keep giving information to this, uh, chairman weber and he's i'm bugging him and he says he says i'm bugging him but i don't care it's the right thing to do we took an oath um, Section 51 to protect the health and the welfare of Michigan citizens back to the red flag bill back to what I'm doing with cigarettes you know I, I really take that oath seriously and this, this this smoking 21 would save lives and also Mitch McConnell from Kentucky he made this as one number one priority priority and he's from a cigarette state and so um, if a uh, Republican he's, he's looking at it too so I 
gave, gave that little article to Chairman Weber also. So I've been bugging, I just, I'm begging for a hearing. And I, um, and I got a lot of hospitals and a lot of people behind me, but I need that hearing. Without hearing, you're dead in the water. Well, when that happens, let us know. That will be an interesting conversation. And finally, in the short time we have left, uh, you have had some success. You were on our show uh, not so long ago talking about an animal mm -hmm. cruelty yeah. bill, and it's now been signed into law. Tell me quickly what that well, law thank will Thank you so do. much. Governor Snyder signed it. It's one of the few com bills he commented on in the lame duck, and he said, we will no longer, Michigan will no longer put up with animal cruelty. And um, I, we call it the Howie Bill after my dog, Howie. And um, this bill says, your, your animal, can I go door to door? And I see people who love their animals. It, I, before your animal was just a coffee cup, piece of property. Now your animal is your companion. And if somebody does something to your animal, it goes from four to 10 years. And the person that killed uh, those 19 kids in Florida, Parkland, he was cutting up live birds uh, on his kitchen table. Person, people that are cruel to animals, there's something wrong with them. And so we should, we should take care of that. And treat, judges should treat it more seriously, not a slap on a wrist. And my bill does this. And I love Governor Snyder for signing it. Thank you, Governor Snyder. As we talk to Representative Brand, when the legislature comes back into session later this month, the first order of business will have to be the budget. It's not clear what other legislation will be taken up, but we'll be watching that closely. And we'll talk to another state rep when we come back. To the point. Welcome back to To the Point. In the state of Michigan, budgets are supposed to be done by the end of September. The fiscal year starts October 1st. So far, the legislature and the governor have not agreed on next year's spending plan, and they're not going back until later this month for session. So exactly where do we stand with the budget? What do we think might happen next? Democrat Dave LeGrand is a member of the State House from Grand Rapids. We talked to him about just that thing. Representative, let's talk about the budget process as it pertains to uh, a long summer of uh, legislative inaction, which is not unusual. We see this. Governor was promoting the idea of the legislature sticking around, but the fact of the matter is there are only a handful of people that are kind of talking about the finer points to the budget right now. So from your perspective, where are we uh, in terms of getting something done? Because uh, if I understand it right, you probably won't go back into session until the end of the month. Right. Uh, well, there's Mark Twain's old line, which is that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Sometimes it can be, it's a bad idea to have too many people involved in a, in a process. So I actually think it's, pr it's a probably the best and healthiest way to do this is to let uh, leadership in both caucuses and, in the, and uh, to engage with the governor and see if we can hammer out um, consensus. I mean, we're in, we're in new territory here, right? I mean, the, we've had, the Republicans have had the governor's mansion for eight years and control of the House and the Senate. Uh, and you, you were, you've been around long enough to remember the bad old days when uh, we were locking people into the Capitol uh, to try to get the budget done and people were going off bighorn sheep hunting and all kinds of crazy stuff was going on. Um, so, uh, you know, yes, this is not as smooth and bump free as it might be if one party controlled all the levers, but uh, I think it's ultimately, as long as it stays collaborative, um, you know, it's probably a healthier process. I've made this observation before and feel free to disagree, but one of the things I've been taken by, first of all, I was surprised that the auto no fault uh, insurance uh, bill came up as quickly as it did. Mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps more surprising is what appears to be a pretty uh, congenial relationship between uh, Senate Majority Leader and the Governor and the Speaker of the House and the Governor. I, up on Mackinac, particularly during the Detroit Policy Conference, you saw him several times engaging in more than just uh, the cordial handshake and passing by. I mean, they were really talking. So is, is that the feel that you get from serving over there, that they're actually having real two-way conversations about the budget? Well, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I can't speak to that as directly, but I'll tell you in my space, the space I'm in, I have had on the issues I'm working on, and those are largely criminal justice and clean government issues, I am in contact with and in really good communication with uh, Leader Chatfield, and also I've had a number of productive conversations with uh, Senator Leader Shirky about those issues. And I don't get shut down because I'm a Democrat and they're a Republican. Well, we're really having substantive discussions and they're, um, 
yeah, we're finding a lot of common ground, um, and there's just a lot of openness to getting things done. And frankly, Speaker Chatfield said it in his in his inaugural speech. He said, "We don't have to be Washington. Um, we can we can actually get along and collaborate." And that's not going to be true on everything. Um, and uh, but but the keeping the lines of communication open, I've really seen that that's massively different than the first two sessions I was in Lan uh, Lansing to walk through. We had the lieutenant governor on uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he and I had a discussion after the fact uh, that really was about the same thing, that there really is the chance to make divided government work after we've seen Washington prove time and time again that they cannot make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so as we enter this uh, budget kind of countdown, if you will, you'll have about four weeks, maybe a little longer, to get a budget put together by the end of September. And the, the sticking point, I presume, from all outward appearances, is still on the roads, 45 cent a gallon gas tax increase versus over in the house, trying to use existing money and moving things around and not coming up with nearly the 2.5, which might actually be more like 1.8, 1.9 billion dollars, uh, and whatever the Senate's going to come up with. That conversation continues. Any guess of what it looks like when it gets down to the end? Is it a hybrid? <laughs> Is there new revenue? Do we have any idea at all? Uh, I really don't. I th I, the, the only thing I'll point out is there is a significant uh, qualifier to what to summarizing it as about the roads, uh, which is that Governor Whitmer put on the table um, a real increase in funding for education. And I, I've actually been reading a lot about um, you know why some regions fail and why some regions succeed around the world, but also in Michigan. And um, education is such a huge predictor of whether a region is going to succeed or fail. And so I think the governor's at that and infrastructure. I mean, there's, there are, we often are very proud of being entrepreneurs in America. There are plenty of entrepreneurs in Guatemala. What they don't have is roads, uh, reliable water, reliable internet. Um, so you can be as entrepreneurial as you want, but if you don't have the infrastructure to go out and start a business, you're not going to get very far. And so keeping our infrastructure uh, in first world condition in Michigan is, I think, critically important. I think the government's absolutely right about that. But you bring up a very interesting point. One of your uh, high priorities, if you go to any of your literature or go to your website, is education funding. Absolutely. I mean, you've talked about that for a long time. And there has been a great divide between not just parties, some of it is party line, but the way we think about education. Some people say, well, wait a minute, it's not about money, it's about quality, it's about time, it's about all these different things. But there is a money component to it. How far off do you think Republicans and Democrats are there, given what, <laughs> yeah. the, point out, what the governor laid out and what the House laid out? Let me put it this way. I think that, I think that we need, there's a lot of room to, to have, to, to define the terms of what we're talking about a lot better. So. I already said I'm doing a lot of work in the criminal justice space. Mm -hmm. And in that space, we've really had this transformation to the point where people are happy to talk about public safety and outcomes and not assume that more incarceration is going to get us. We don't want more incarceration. What we want is more public safety. So how do we get there? Well, in the educational space, Base, we all want outcomes, but we have to have, I think, better conversations about how we're going to get there. And defining some of those terms is very important. So accountability and metrics are critical. But what, to give you one example, um, I think that paying an equal amount for cyber schools as for brick and mortar schools is irrational. I don't think there's a good defense for it. I've never heard a good defense for it. That's what we're doing in our Michigan uh, education funding right now. Well, having a conversation about the differences between those two, we haven't even gotten to a point where we're willing to have a rational conversation about the fact that a brick and mortar school does m provides massively more services for families than a cyber school ever possibly would. For one thing, it's keeping your kids safe uh, during the day. It's feeding them meals. I mean, all those kinds of things are uh, taxpayer-funded things that we do for children that a cyber school is not going to do. Well, paying them the same amount just gives them a huge advertising budget. That doesn't seem to be a defensible position, but we haven't even got to the point where we're really having that conversation yet. So that's just one, one example in the educational space. Well, then let's talk a little bit about criminal justice because that was an area that on the opening salvo of the House session, uh, what I described as uh, polar political opposites with Speaker Chatfield and Attorney General uh, Nessel stood side by side and talked about legislation that you were involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, that was forfeit. Uh, um, civil asset forfeiture. Civil asset forfeiture. Um, 
which is part of the criminal justice reform that you've worked on. Uh, so how do, how do you get to that process when you get two people who have different political philosophies largely working in the same direction? Well, you know, what I say a lot about this is when Democrats get angry or Republicans get angry, they start attributing um, bad motives to the people on the other side of the fence. And that's really corrosive. And particularly, they even start ascribing bad moral intent. And what I constantly am re uh, reminding folks on my side of the aisle is when you talk with Republicans about issues and, and you talk in a moral framework, they're right there with you. Um, they don't want to do bad things. Republicans don't get up in the morning and want to do bad in the world. They want to do good in the world. And so if you can have a conversation that's around outcomes and moral discussions, you often get to great places. So Speaker Chatfield, very moral person, takes his, takes his ethics and morality very seriously. So if you're having a conversation about is it fair that we are dividing our country and we have very different outcomes for rich people and poor people in our justice system, I think the answer is no. Speaker Chatfield thinks the answer is no. I mean, it's evident to both of us um, that we don't want a two-track system where we're treating some of our systems, uh, citizens different than others. I mean, he actually tweeted very forcefully against uh, white nationalism yesterday, and uh, I was very glad to see that. I mean, racism is a real problem in America. Uh, it has not gone away, and, um, and it seems to be arming itself and radicalizing itself uh, rhetorically, and we're well past rhetoric now uh, and into actions, and that's really scary. Um, but that is that should absolutely not be a partisan discussion. That is a that is a moral discussion um, that we all have to we all have to stand up and be counted and be on the side of right. As so often happens when you and I sit down, we run out of time before we get to a whole lot of the things <laughs> I want to talk about. But quickly. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of what you're doing in addition to the criminal justice uh, reform, which you have a, a real passion for, but you're also interested in making sure that government has a little bit more accountability or at least a little bit more transparency. Yeah. I mean, we're in this point in America where politicians are broadly distrusted by the electorate. And they don't know why, but they don't trust them. Um, we've got to do everything we can to break that down. And that means politicians have to be more transparent and more accountable. And f in Michigan, one of the things that I think we need to do is individual politicians have to be willing to disclose their finances. Because if you don't know where my money is, you don't know whether that's influencing my votes. And voters really want to know that their representatives are representing and not self-enriching. And I think that financial disclosure is really something we've got to, we've got to work on. Um, real progress in the House on that, 63 co-sponsors to the package we introduced, which means a majority of the members of the House uh, are supportive, having conversations in the Senate, and um, I'm hoping we're going to have some progress there. Quickly, before you get out of here, I'm going to let you uh, plug your Progressives in the Park, third annual coming. Yeah, uh, we're having a party uh, in uh, Wilcox Park, and it's this coming Tuesday. Um, we had a couple thousand people there last time. The first year we did it, we made the mistake of not having beer. This year we have beer <laughs> um, and uh, food trucks, and it's just a great time for people to go around and meet uh, people who are engaging in the community do, doing great work. So we have tents set up for individual organizations. So if people in the community want to come out and they want to work on helping refugees or they want to work on um, you know, uh, volunteering in the schools or any of those good civic things, they can come find the organizations that are doing that, network with them, and maybe go make the community stronger, which is what we all want. Those are just two of the state lawmakers ready to head back to Lansing and tackle the budget issues they'll have to deal with as soon as they return. When we return, a final note to the point. Mass shootings around the country have lawmakers looking for some way to try to prevent such a tragedy from happening here. But when they head back to Lansing at the end of this month, their first priority will have to be the budget. So we'll see exactly what gets done on both fronts and we'll keep you informed every Sunday morning right here to the point.